And now something of a tease for all you pronunciation sticklers out there waiting impatiently for change you can listen to. Here is the president-elect. We'll invest in clean coal technology, safely harness nuclear power. Did he say nuclear? No, he didn't. It's a new age. But it doesn't officially start for another 61 days. Meanwhile, the country's has problems. President Bush has authority and so as a continuing public service it's another episode of Lame Duck Watch. Animation? Nice duck. Let's start with ducks actually. Ducks, wildlife, and we learned tonight the Bush administration is planning to relax regulations covering endangered species and wildlife in their environment which is protected by the Environmental Protection Agency. Does the EPA mission jibe with this lame duck news? The agency is currently finalizing new air quality rules making it easier to build coal plants, oil refineries, and other major polluters near national parks, even though half of the EPA's 10 regional administrators formally dissented from the decision. The proposal would change how pollution levels are actually measured, which in written statements EPA administrators say would undermine critical air quality protections for parks such as Virginia's Shenandoah, seen here, which is frequently plagued by smog and poor visibility. Remember, dear viewers, the P of EPA stands for protection. On the president's calendar today, the reopening of the National Museum of American History in Washington, which he calls a, quote, fantastic place of learning. He also talked about some of the items displayed in the museum. Visitors can see George Washington's military uniform, one of Thomas Edison's early light bulbs, the desk on which Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence. So what artifact of the Bush era will be displayed at the museum? Here's hoping it's not some representation of America's shrinking collective nest egg, but it might be. Stocks closed down 400 points today to a more than five-year low amid worries about the fate of the American auto industry. And the economy, as a bailout for the troubled sector, grows increasingly unlikely. The $25 billion Democratic bailout proposal in the Senate has stalled due to weak support. And late today, Majority Leader Harry Reid canceled the scheduled Thursday showdown vote on the proposal. So will there be a bailout for the so-called big three car makers? Harry Reid says it is up to the president. The AP reported that the Senate is preparing to, quote, punt to the White House. White House, what say you? The Congress uh, will bear responsibility for anything that happens in the next uh, couple of months during their long vacation. So nobody, no the lame duck Congress nor the lame duck president appears to want to do anything. What should they be doing? Joining me now, Paul Krugman, New York Times op-ed columnist and professor of economics at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Mr. Krugman, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Sure. I know this is, is complex and layered, but I hope you will permit me to start with a basic choice. Should the auto industry receive a $25 billion bailout, or should it be allowed to fail and file Chapter 11 bankruptcy? Uh, I think it should be rescued. Um, it, and it's not, you know, a less deserving bunch of chief executives would be hard to find. Uh, an industry, it's been badly run, lots of bad decisions. But... Do you want to, you know, sort of offhandedly take the chance of letting this thing really disappear? Because, you know, Chapter 11 is, uh, is supposed to keep a, a company in being, right? You stave off the creditors, you keep it in being, but it won't work in this case. Uh, the trade credit, you know, the sort of the credit you need to keep operating is not available because the financial markets are a mess. Uh, and will people buy cars from a bankrupt auto company? very doubtful. So if you let this thing slide, you just say, well, you know, I don't really want to give them the money. You can wake up three months from now, two months from now, 61 days from now, that's the thing we're worried about, and find that you've lost those companies on a permanent basis. It's an irreversible decision. And I think we should just, it makes a lot of sense to kick this can 61 days down the road so we can, we can deal with it intelligently. So, but why is the auto industry so special? Why should it be given money for essentially extremely poor management? No, it's not that it's special. It's just that it's big and that it's on the verge of failure. 
It's just we are in the middle of a very, you know, the, the economy is in, no, in a nosedive, and this is something that will greatly accelerate the nosedive. If GM goes under, which looks like a real possibility, then that's a huge blow. It's a huge anti-stimulus program at exactly the wrong moment. If this was 1999 and we had 4% unemployment and the credit markets were working, I would say let it fail, let bankruptcy do its work, but this is not a good time to be having a really major industry just turn belly up. I'm wondering if some of the opposition to all of this could be a bit of bailout fatigue, Fannie, Freddie, AIG. If, if the car companies had shown up first, perhaps they would have been given an easier ride. Pardon that, the that's term. not. I think it's a little more complicated than that, and, and uh, a little less creditable than that. It's partly that mm. that it's partly that we, we basically are seeing the, the White House and the you know the the, uh, the 49 seats that the Republicans have in the current Congress, in the current Senate. Uh, they're just sort of checking out, sort of you know not our responsibility. We don't want to deal with stuff, uh, and we don't want to take any any difficult decisions. Uh, and part of it is just uh, there are regional things. You know we do have the big three are not the whole auto industry. There, is a, uh, there are a lot of foreign companies operating in the United States. They're in different states. It would be really bad for Michigan and pretty bad for the U.S. economy if GM goes under, but not so bad for Alabama, let's say, which has got a lot of transplant uh, factories. So there's a lot of, you know, there's special interests on all sides here, and uh, the trouble is that we're, we're on the verge possibly of making a really irreversible decision almost in a fit of absence of mind. Now, do you think a bailout should come with conditions? Um, as much as you can, but time is, you know, it's going to take some time to get a, a reasonable plan together. We're really talking about a, bit, a bridge loan here. We're really talking about giving us a couple of months so that the thing doesn't shrivel up before we have a chance to figure out what can be saved. Uh, if you say, you know, we have to have a comprehensive plan and we have to have it in three weeks, and uh, or we have to have it, you know, now for a, for a vote this week. Uh, we're not going to have it, and yet if we don't do something, we may see these these companies go under. It's just this. It's it's a terrible way to make decisions, but you know, it's a terrible economy. You touched on something in your very first answers. I'm sure people are watching at home or watching on their computers. The CEOs asking for a huge amount of money when their base salaries are in the millions and once you put together all the incentives they can go up to thirteen fourteen million dollars oh. yet they're asking people give us twenty five billion dollars sure no it's like i said these are not these are not good guys and uh... if you know and and they took they took corporate jets to the to their to plead for money in washington right this is they they, mm. they are idiots this is the theatrics was really stupid right uh... but Nonetheless, that's not the point. The point is that there are, you know, estimates run from one million to three million jobs lost if uh, if GM goes under, uh, and those, you know, and so there's probably twelve guys out of those one million to three million people who are really bad guys and fly corporate jets and really don't deserve any bailout. But the other nine hundred ninety-nine thousand. Uh, I can't do the, the, the subtraction right here. All those other people are you know, people trying to make a living, people who will lose their sure. jobs, lose their health insurance. That's where you should be putting the priority. Paul Krugman, New York Times op-ed columnist, Nobel laureate, and Princeton economics professor. Thank you for your time tonight, Mr. Krugman. Thanks a lot.